segments are on Israelite law. And we're going to do two segments on Israelite law this week. Um, you know, we call the first five books of the Bible the Torah. Torah is law. Um, there's hardly any actual law. There's not really law as such in Genesis. You get the, the giving of the law in Exodus and then different laws in uh, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Israelite law is a very, very complicated topic. Um, I'm not particularly an expert on Israelite law. I mean, I, I know a little bit about it, but um, it really is its own field, and it's very, very complex. Um, and of the chapters in Fee, I was a little... Um, I was a little less taken with, with this chapter 9 on the law than I have been with some others that he's written. I, I'm not saying it was bad, it just wasn't my favorite. Um, the law, Israelite law, is a covenant. And the, the, the foundational covenant of Judaism is the Abrahamic covenant of Genesis 17. And that is where um, God says to Abraham, um, or Abram, he's Abram at this time. Um, well, he changes his name, actually, in the, in the midst of this covenant. No longer, verse 5, no longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you, even throughout their generations, forever, uh, for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land where you are now an alien, all the land of Canaan for perpetual holding, and I will be their God. So for God's part, what God is going to do is... Um, multiply Abraham's offspring and give him the land of Canaan. And, and then what does Abraham have to do? He and all his household and all his slaves have to be circumcised. Now, why circumcision? I have no idea. But that is what God wants out of Abraham and his family. Um, so that's the basic covenant that establishes the relationship between God and Israel. But then Israel goes into slavery for hundreds of years. And when Israel comes out of slavery, God has to sort of reconstitute Israel as a people. And so let's jump ahead to Exodus 19. Okay, so in Exodus 19, 3, Then Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the Israelites, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. These are the words you shall speak to the Israelites. So uh, Moses summoned them all to all the elders together and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. And the people respond Everything that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Um, now, move ahead to verse... Okay, then um, Moses consecrates the people. Um, and on the morning of the third day... So, so, you know, they get everything clean, ritually clean so that they can encounter God in this way. On the morning of the third day, in verse 16, there was thunder and lightning as well as a thick cloud on the mountain, a blast of a trumpet so loud that all the people who were in the camp trembled. Moses brought the people out of the camp, 
to meet God. They took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now, um, Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended upon it in fire. The smoke went up like the smoke of a kiln while the whole mountain shook violently. As the blast of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses would speak and God would answer him in thunder. When the Lord descended upon Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, the Lord summoned Moses to the top of the mountain and Moses went up. So this is, this is the reestablishment of the covenant with Israel. And it's after that this covenant is reestablished that Israel receives the law. And that begins in verse 20. And the first laws that Israel receives are the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, which we went over last time. Then there are other commandments, laws concerning worship, laws concerning slaves, laws concerning violence, property, restitution, uh, social and religious law. I'm just reading the, the headings out of my Bible. Justice for all sabbatical years, festivals. And then in verse 24, uh, in chapter 24, 3 through 8, we get the ratification of the covenant. So God's established the people, preparing for them for the covenant. God gives them the law, which is sort of the, the meat of the covenant. And then we get the ratification of the covenant. Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the ordinances and all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. He rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and set up 12 pillars corresponding to the 12 tribes of Israel. He sent young men uh, of the people of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed oxen as offerings of well-being to the Lord. Moses took half the blood, put it in basins, and half the blood he dashed against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do, and we will be obedient. Moses took the blood and dashed it on the people and said, see the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. See the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. And the covenant's ratified. Okay. So the law is, is sort of the, the content of the human covenant, the covenant between God and Israel. God is going to be their God, and God is going to bless them and protect them. But at the same time, they have to live in a particular way. And it's a way different than the Canaanite people who live around them. Um, now, we, we get another form of the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy 5. 6 through 21. And in Deuteronomy uh, 6, the covenant is laid out a little bit differently. Deuteronomy 6. Let's see here. I mean, what, what you get in Deuteronomy 6 is this idea of, I mean, Deuteronomy and the section of the Bible that we call the Deuteronomistic history is really, um, there's, there's a sense of blessing and curse. Mm -hmm. And if you live the way God wants you to live, there's going to be blessing that follows. And if you don't live the way God wants you to live, if you set aside the law and you set aside the covenant, you're going to be cursed. Um, so, so you, you do these things so that it may go well with you. Look at 6.3. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe them diligently, so that it may go well with you, and so you may multiply in a land flowing with milk and honey. 
these, the covenant, the law, is at the very heart of Israel's identity as a people. And in 6.4, we get sort of the, the most basic creedal statement of Judaism, which we call the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Keep these words that I am, reci that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down, when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. It, it's constitutive of what it means to be an Israelite person, the law. Okay, now... Uh, Fee and Stuart talk about the difference between apodictic and casuistic laws. Um, I think there are a lot of different ways you could divide up the laws. I don't quite know why they, they pick these. Um, they're not the only person who do that. I mean, th those are pretty kind of standard um, categories for thinking about Israelite law. But the Israelite uh, apodictic laws are just general laws that could they're not really situational and they apply basically to everyone so like you will not kill that is an apodictic law it's not really conditional it's just God saying um, really what it is, is you won't commit murder don't commit murder just as a rule wherever you are do not commit murder um, then there are casuistic laws, and these are more like situational or conditional laws. Sometimes they're called case laws. Like Leviticus uh, 1933. Let's look at that. Uh, when an alien resides with you in your land, you shall not oppress the alien. The alien who resides with you shall be to you as a citizen among you. You shall love the alien as yourself, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Um, now that's conditional. It relates to instances where the people of Israel have aliens living among them. If there weren't any aliens living among them, then this would be irrelevant. And, you know, there are other laws, say, involving skin conditions. If you have this skin condition, then you have to do this in order to be purified, and you have to, you know, these, these things have to take place. But if you don't have that skin condition, or no one around you has it, then it's irrelevant. That's a, that's a casuistic law. But... Um, the ap apodictic laws are just more general and just and binding on everyone, despite the circumstances. Okay, you, you understand the difference there. Mm -hmm. Okay, how are we doing on time? Twelve minutes. Oh, we got tons of time. Okay. Um, the laws. There are six hundred something laws in. 613 laws in the Old Testament and they they don't cover every aspect of life um, and after the destruction of the temple in the first century um, there there began to develop uh, a body of writing first the Mishnah and then the Talmud that was commentary on the law. But even before that, there were oral traditions around the law mm -hmm. to, to, to um, oral and written traditions around the law to help Israelites live um, more faithfully to the, the laws that God had given. Uh, the Pharisees, for example, um, had um, an oral tradition about the law that they lived by. And then there are texts called Targumim that are 
also um, uh, commentaries, biblical commentaries, essentially, and talk about they they explain the law. Um, public life, uh, maintaining the order of God's creation, uh, what you should eat and what you should not eat, what you should wear and what you should not wear, um, issues like adultery, um, these are all covered in the law. So for example, um, look at Deuteronomy 19.15. We're bouncing around a lot today, I know. So it gives you just sort of a basic rule of how you're supposed to live. Uh, uh, a single witness shall not suffice to convict a person of any crime or wrongdoing in connection with any offense that may be committed. Only on the evidence of two or three witnesses shall a charge be sustained. Um, and false witnesses are, they get in a lot of trouble. And of course, that's also one of the Ten Commandments, not to bear false witness. I mean, this, this is what that commandment is about. Um, Deuteronomy 22, uh, 5. Um, this is kind of about maintaining the order of God's creation. A woman shall not wear a man's apparel, nor shall a man put on a woman's garment. Um, and then verse 9, You shall not sow your vineyard with a second kind of seed, or the whole yield will have to be forfeited, both the crop that you have sown and the yield of the vineyard itself. Uh, verse 10, You shall not plow with an ox and a donkey yoke together. Now, these these kinds of admonitions can seem, these kinds of laws can seem kind of odd to us, but you have to understand that they are rooted in a vision of what the ideal creation is like. Um, you shall not wear clothes made of wool and linen woven together. Um, there are a lot of different, there's a lot of scholarship on this, okay, and a lot of different theories as to why um, you would not want to do this. But I think that it goes back to the Israelite understanding of sort of the perfect order of creation. I think that a lot of the food laws go back to this as well. I mean, Fee and Stewart really talk about it in terms of like health issues, uh, the kinds of things that wouldn't be considered clean to eat are, you know, it's actually good for the Israelites not to eat these things. It's physical. I don't really think that's what's at stake. I think what's at stake is more of a, it's a particular vision of the world. And what we're trying to do is, is we're trying to recreate the kind of wholeness and purity that characterizes God's creation. Um, that's why I think these mixing of categories is not considered a good thing to do uh, by the Israelites. Now, um, food laws. Let's look at some of the food laws. Deuteronomy 14. Uh, let's see, 14, 3. You should not eat any abhorrent thing. These are the animals you may eat. The ox, the sheep, the goat, the deer, the gazelle, the roebuck, the wild goat, the ibex, the antelope, and the mountain sheep. Any, any animal that divides the hoof and has the hoof cleft in two and chews the cud among animals you may eat. So it's kind of like, it's kind of like the cow is, is like the archetype here. Um, yet those that chew the cud or have the hoof cleft, 
you shall you shall not eat these. Um, they have to have both, right? You can't just have one. So you can't eat a rock badger. Um, you can't eat a hare. Because these do one but not the other, and so they don't fit the archetype. At least I think that's, that's what's going on here. Um, now then, thankfully, we don't have to fuss too much about this because Jesus declared all foods fit to eat. And then we get this again in Peter's dream before he goes to Cornelius in Acts 10. So thank you, Lord, for that. Um, adultery. Let's look at Deuteronomy 22. 22.22. 22. If a man is caught lying with the wife of another man, both of them shall die. The man who lay with the woman as well as the woman. You shall purge the evil from Israel. Um, all right, now we get some different kinds of laws in Leviticus um, 17 is usually when this is said to start. Um, we, we call this the holiness code, okay? Holiness is a very important concept in Israel. Um, in fact, this is a little bit of a large topic, and I'm not going to have enough time really to get through it. So I'm going to stop here, and then we'll pick this up in the next uh, segment.